Yeah, it's it's well, that's that's one of the problems with life is it's just so hard to know know when to set boundaries. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's we, not we always the podcast we well. always breach them. Oh, oh, we're recording. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are we? We are. We, oh. well, well, let me check. Um, <laughs> oh, we are. Welcome, okay. folks. Uh, Can you say the what? <laughs> I talked over you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are here today at Illinois Wesleyan University mm -hmm. exploring a work of William Shakespeare, <laughs> King Henry V. We are. Um, I'm Grace Lumpkin, and I'm here with... Evan Carlson. Um, and yeah, so we're going to jump right in. Um, we actually, uh, along with reading the text, uh, we... <laughs> We viewed two different, two very different film versions of this text. Um, one being Olivier's, which was um, filmed in 1944 in the middle of World War II, which is insane to us. Um, and the other being uh, Kenneth Brant, Sir Kenneth Branagh's uh, version that was uh, filmed in 1989. Um, one we would say is very pro-war, as it was filmed during a war, and, and the other is more ambivalent, which seems a little more true, at least to us, to the play's kind of original intent. Um, so, yeah. I would say so. Yeah, and, and I believe, just to set the record straight, uh, Laurence Olivier, I believe, is also Sir Laurence Olivier. My bad. I would hope so. My hope bad. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, let's, let's start at the top. So, um, we open the play... On, um, why am I nervous? <laughs> okay, we open the play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what happens in this play? It's a big one. It's a big it's one. It's a big one. Um, but ultimately, it is, a, it is a play about war, um, about, you know, going to war and whether or not it's just and, and the outcome of war. So we start on them trying, trying their hardest. We start in the English court, and they're, they're clearly trying to justify a war with France. They're doing this through complicated lineages. They're doing this through the clergy, just saying like, hey, we will put money behind it. Um, Salic law. Yes. A very, very long speech uh, about Salic law. And um, then uh, we actually get to go to war when, and when the French ambassador comes. So they've already started kind of moving into France at this point. Um, England has. And so France sends an ambassador. The ambassador presents a gift. The gift is tennis balls, which is clearly <laughs> a mock. So um, Henry, Henry gives a speech that some would, some would see as a tantrum. Um, but really, at, at least in my reading of the play, really seems like he grabbed a justification and ran with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Should we read that speech? Uh, well, let's keep moving through the the play. Okay. Yeah, we can. Yeah. There, there's there's so much there's so much left. Okay. Where, where where'd you just leave off? That was um. <laughs> we're going to war. We're going to war. Oh Lord, yes, and 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 before that, we we see the we see the the regular old people who are about to get ready to go off to France and England. Um, and and that's where we find out that Sir John Falstaff, uh, who, who also a sir, sir, yeah, uh, in a different time. But he, he was a knight, and he would have been going to war with them, but he, he's sick in bed. He's dying of a broken heart and other ailments, um, and, and they're all mourning his loss for just a moment Yes, before um, they go off to war. And then we hop back to Henry, who, who is faced with some traitorous fellows, um, some of his, he finds out some of his closest advisors are working with France. And so um, he gets them real good. He gives them a little letter that they think is their assignment within the war, something to bring them honor and prestige. But in fact, it is a letter saying, we know what you did, you evil traitors. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if he hadn't uh, of, of treated Falstaff like he did, Falstaff might have been proud of him, of him for, uh, for that little moment of, yeah. of trickery, a little bit of how. And we see, we see a little bit of how throughout this play. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, we got traitors are gone. We're going to war. Uh, we get we get that first battle. We get the very famous uh, "Once more unto the breach" speech that many 
No. Oh, it's great. We'll we'll say it later. <laughs> we'll say it later. Um, and so uh, this first battle at Agincourt, they, the first one's at Agincourt. Is the second at Agincourt? Wait. I, they they do have a battle though. Wait. Which, <laughs> I think the details the details muddy things up. Okay, but they, no they details. Fight, they fight. They, they fight a battle. They, they win a foothold in France. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and the, and we see some soldiers. We see Flewellen, who's very well versed on on military history and 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 enjoys talking about it. He's a Welshman, much like the king himself, King Henry, um, and 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 lots and lots of. These little conversations happen. We see the French very, um, very much believing that they have the upper hand. They do in this play. They've got way more men. Mm-hmm. It's their homeland. Mm-hmm. The English shouldn't be able to win. No, by no means. And so, by the time we come to this final battle, that was not historically the final battle, but for our play is. Um, the English are not confident in, in in their chances of success. They're kind of on the same page as the French in that sense. And uh, we we really get a glimpse of this because King Henry dons a cloak or perhaps Ooh. a slight... Hmm? In the dark of night. Oh, <laughs> I was like, am I wrong? No, it's spooky. It's spooky. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. So, you know, his... <laughs> He's a little hidden, or maybe they just don't know who he is. It really depends on what production you see. Uh, but he comes into the camps as a normal person, and um, he gets a real eye open. He gets, I, I think his eyes are pretty open by these interactions. His men are scared, and they're being honest with this man who they think is just one of them. Yeah. And, and they very much say that, you know, if we die and this war was not fought on just grounds... Um, kind of full circling back to the beginning where they were seeing if this war was justifiable. Uh, they're basically like, it is the king's fault, and it will be the king's fault. It will be on his head. It's his sin. And uh, King Henry's kind of like, whoa, now. Oh, yeah. Well, well, he, he gets he gets kind of uh, offended by it, but they're, they're, they sort of double down, and they're like, no, if, if when we die, he's just going to go back ahead and, and, and take whatever... They give him after we all lose. Mm-hmm. He's gonna he's gonna give in and actually take the the, the ransom or whatever it is. Um, they don't trust him. They I mean they trust him in in the sense that he's their king, and they have to follow him and everything. But but they don't they don't really see him as a, as somebody who's standing with them and for them. Mm. And after this, we I mean throughout the play we've seen Henry losing people, um, but in this moment he feels very alone and he kind of laments the 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 sol- the solidarity of of being a king um as in solitude <laughs> uh i don't know if i use that word correctly but solitude yeah solitude um and i think in this moment of course he's mourning the all of the people he's lost on the way whether that's falstaff whether that's bardolf which we mi- we actually missed that plot point oh, that's yes. an important one do you want to talk about that real quick? Well, Bardolph is a is an old drinking buddy of of Hal's, who is now King Henry V, and uh, and he he goes and he, and he steals something from a French soldier, and 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 that's the kind of thing that that you'd get put to death for. Isn't it from a church? I think he stole. Oh, it's, it's from, from a church. It, it might be from a church. Yeah, he he he, he did go, some kind of pillaging. He did pillaging, which isn't isn't allowed in these these rules of mm. war. And, and war he, crimes, if you will, essentially that, yeah. Well, and and he was he was old friends with with Hal, but but ever since Hal said to Falstaff, "I don't know you, old man," he he's he's left that those drinking and 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 fun buddies uh, away. I mean, Hal used to steal stuff. <laughs> fun buddies. Fun buddies. Yeah. Well, and 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 Hal 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 says, or Henry says, no, he he's going to hang um, mm-hmm. for this. It. it it doesn't matter to him that they have a history together because uh, as king now, he, he, he makes that decision. Because and perhaps it does matter to him. Oh, yeah. Right, that it's a friend. Like, perhaps this affects him, but he has to set an example for his troops, which is one of many moments that we see him stepping into his oh, role yeah. as king. Well, I imagine it profoundly affects him. Yeah. But, I mean, we see with the Dauphin ta- taunting him in the first place that you know his position is not secure people know of his reputation no. they think england is vulnerable they don't think he's going to measure up and this feels like one of those moments where he proves that he can be a great and just king 
who punishes people bases, based on their actions and not just their loyalty or their connection to him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a sad moment, um, but the play goes on. It does. They, and um, they fight. They continue on. I mean, that's that's before we get to this night before the battle. So this night before the battle happens, he's feeling very alone. He's feeling like he doesn't really have much to show for being a king. He feels that it's really a burden. Um, and I think all of this and his chats with the soldiers lead into one of his great speeches, which is at the beginning of this battle, um, where, you know, he says, like, if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. Yeah. And he rallies the troops, and they... And they fight. And, and they, they fight, and they win. They win by a lot, by by a, a crazy amount. And that is not historically accurate. No, but, it's, uh, but, but they, they still did win in history. And then, and then there's, a weird, there's a weird little scene at the end. The, last, the whole last act, I think, mm. or the last scene, is him wooing Kate. Yes. I do think, well, okay. One thing as far as the battle, though, I do think it's important to note that one of the events of the battle that ends the battle is um, the French come in and kill all of the boys that they've left at their camp, uh, which yes. is totally a war crime as well. And they point that out. They're like, this is despicable. Um, and they're not actually even sure if they won when they find out that they win. Yeah. So very, very ambivalent about war and about, you know, there is no like victorious close to this battle. It's a, I mean, they're hit with a tragic loss of all of these young children. It's awful. Yeah. Um, but then they do win. They, yeah, they win and, and... But at what cost? And at right? what cost? Right, like, we're, it's kind of put in your face of, like, at what cost? Yeah. Yeah, and it... Uh, so that's... That, I suppose, is is the whole play, King Henry V. It and, is. And if we got anything wrong, um, I will say that we're reading out of a secret uh, folio edition that, um, <laughs> that no others have access to, so... Yeah, we are actually descendant of Shakespeare, so we have new special yeah, access it, to that kind it of stuff. Really, it really makes life great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and before we get into to sort of digging deeper into some of the play and adaptations and stuff, I did want to bring in this cool little thing about yeah. about the original, um, potentially original production. Okay, um, Pot- like Shakespeare's, like uh, the, the Shakespeare like the King's Men. Yeah, well, well, it's there, there's this fascinating history of why there's no. Falstaff in this play. Right, because in both the film adaptations we watch, they do show him, but he oh, yeah, is they not show technically... But he's not a character. This he's is, not a character in this play. This is the most beloved character in the whole canon at the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, and he's not in this play. And interestingly enough, at the end of King Henry IV Part Two, the epilogue says, um, one word more, I beseech you, if you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, or hum- our humble author will continue the story with Sir John in it and make you marry with fair Catherine of France. And he goes on, and he says at the end of King Henry the Fourth, Part Two, mm-hmm. the next play is going to have Falstaff in it, and it's going to make you marry. Yeah, so what? And, and some people why think, it? some scholars think, that the guy who played Falstaff had yeah. sort of a falling out with the oh. troop. And at the time of King Henry IV Part Two going up, he thought, of course I'm going to be in the next one. I'll just say, I'm in the next play. This might not have even oh. been Shakespeare who wrote it. It might have just been an epilogue that the actor said at the end. That's Y'all very, love me. Yeah. That's very false stuff of him, though. Exactly, yeah. Like, to be fair, like... <laughs> <laughs> and then... <laughs> That's basically what he says is the king in the tavern speech. Yeah. And so this is this is a little bit speculative, but it's kind of interesting that at the end of that play it's like, I'll be back. Yeah. No, nope, he's dead. I mean it's 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 he's it's dead really and he's he's not even I mean, no lines. And like and they report everything that happens with him, so he doesn't yeah. have to be seen yeah. at all. And in a stage production in a film production it makes sense to see him. But I can't imagine having an actor simply lay in bed and die. For oh no, a second. no, yeah, you know, they, they you, wouldn't. Have you done just it. wouldn't cast that person. Well, it's it's sort of fascinating because to kind of get into uh, the the whole idea of war. I mean, this is a different play than the first two. Falstaff mm-hmm. is sort of this this funny guy. I mean, he he brings out these these profound insights into humanity, but he's still he's still got some hilarious moments. Um, but this play doesn't have any kind of 
humor like that. And it doesn't have a clown character, which apparently a lot of uh, versions of Henry V at the time had a clown with Henry. This is this is not as funny as, as, as other versions of this play or what this play could have been if Shakespeare went with what was popular with Falstaff and continued on with that. And what um, we found really interesting upon viewing um, Olivier's Henry V, the 1944 war, very pro-war version, um, was that... Uh, so the beginning of this production was set in the globe, and the end of this production was set in the globe. Um, and the middle, when they went off to battle, transferred you to a more realistic setting, which I, I say realistic, but it's still painted, <laughs> and it's still models, and we had a fun time with that. But, oh, uh, God. Uh, <laughs> scenic design needed some help back then. But... But um, they, they start and end in this, this playing area where they very much, tr- like, uh, I don't know if it's a stylistic choice or, like, uh, they very much, like, attempt to make this play funny. Um, oh, yeah. The whole beginning, it, it's a bit of a mockery, um, and they kind of make the lords, um, they, no, they make the clergymen, the clergymen who are coming to Henry in the beginning clown-type figures. Yeah, they're sort of bumbling over Salic Law. They've got lots of papers, and he's like, wait, what's the next piece of Salic Law? Mm-hmm. Here it is. It's in this. And there, it's, it's, it's... Strange physicality. It's, it's a whole joking thing, and it, 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 it starts it off with this... Um, this is going to be lighthearted, and, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. And another interesting thing on that fun note uh, that I I really noticed is that the chorus and all of the sets are are very brightly colored. Um, oh, yeah. uh, it, it looks fun. It, even when right before they're about to go into this final battle, that they do establish that they think they're going to lose. Like that is in yeah, the play. Yeah. That's that's kept in this version. A lot is cut, and we'll get into that. What's cut in a second because oh, yeah. it's quite the list. Um, and some of the best moments in the play were cut, in our opinion. But, mm. you know, in order to make it less ambiguous and more pro-war, they made those choices. But um, right before the battle, we were watching it, and we were like, it looks like a carnival. Like, yeah, these yeah. These tents and these brightly colored tights, like, all the boys are, like, helping them get dressed in, like, a fun way. It, yeah. It looks like a carnival. Well, it's, it's like, we're off to war, we're off to fight for our nation. It's It's this... This unifying thing, and I mean, it, it makes sense. It's World War Two. It's 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 the British. I mean, there there's 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 not really another version of this movie to be popularly made at that time in that place. But it, it really it really is right now kind of a stark um, thing to see where they they make this yeah into this war is this happy uh, uh, honorable. Uh, valorous is that a word? Val- Maybe full of, full of valor. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and also like fun and kind of low stakes. Like one of the oh, things yeah. that struck us was the <laughs> once more into the breach speech, um, which is Henry rousing the troops, um, was turned into like it, uh, it's the chillest version I could imagine, um, and and you know Olivier who is one of the greatest actors of the time, is playing Henry V, and he's just giving this performance that's very questionable in a modern context, specifically on that speech. Oh, yeah. Well, that that one, and then the the Crispin's Day. Crispin's Day, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean... These are the two big battle speeches, to Battle clarify. speeches, I mean, it's it's sort of... In this, he, he's he's on his horse, and, and everybody's fighting, and then they... He starts talking, and everybody sort of this is walks the once over. more into the breach. Speech. Yeah, yeah, and 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 he's just like, everybody, listen to me for a moment. Let's all pause the battle because we can do that. And men file in from the direction of the just, battle, just calmly <laughs> and orderly, yeah, until they're all just kind of standing around him silently. Well, that's where that's where there's sort of a a disservice to the original text as well, is because it kind of presents war in a more ordered manner than it Clean. is when, when it's, I mean, it's chaos. It's, mm. it's, it's this chaos. And, and we get chaos a bit in the second battle, but the first, I mean, especially when you compare it to 
Kenneth Branagh's version. Mm. Um, the Once More Into the Breach speech is is much more impactful because it both have these openings that are leading to a battle, but this other one, it, Branagh's, we're seeing explosions in the breach, and it, you can see that going in there is scary. Like, you understand why the troops are running away, and you're understanding why Henry has to motivate them, and it's a very you know, vigorous speech because it, it, you can tell that it's terrifying. Oh, yeah. Um, you're seeing, you're not seeing the battle on the other side, but you are seeing uh, the general idea of what's happening. Um, and we just get a more realistic feel of what war would have been like. Yeah. Grace? Yeah. Would you like to read part of that speech? I'm nervous. For us? <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> well, um, I have no idea. That's awesome. Do you want to talk about something else while I find it? Well, it's... Um, <laughs> or we could edit this. I, I believe that we should not I edit. found it. I uh, found it. Just, yeah, just read us the first part so we can... I got it. Okay. We can enjoy this, this language. <coughs> your soldiers, you're, you're, you're fighting France, and, and your king is now speaking to you, and he says... Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, conjure up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a gallid rock or hanged and juddy his confounded base. I'm going to stop now. Okay, sure. But I mean, <laughs> whew, that you is... You see the imagery and the... This is where you can see that somebody could interpret this play in a pro-war way because mm. this is, I mean, this is just... The, the epitome of like it's glorifying the, the glory in war and 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 ugly parts. I mean he says in peace in peace uh, you you want modest stillness and humidity and not humidity humility. humility humility although it's in England so well this is actually in France but in peacetime they'd be in England <laughs> hopefully um, so that's why I said he that. he did not mean humidity Um Shakespeare but, did not mean that. No, but he, but he, he did mean humility, <laughs> and and so he's saying in peace we we need to be these this one kind of man, Quite but humble. But but in the war, when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the actions of the tiger. It's it's almost like occasionally we are called to war and we have to act. It's 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 really a call to fight, and and you can see how this in especially World War Two could be used as a call to action and a call mm. to, 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 for national pride. Not the pride. way he read it, but yeah. Well, no. I, I mean, <laughs> Olivier, Olivier was... That was questionable. I, I can... I appreciate that the historical significance of this play, and, and I, I imagine that we, we since then in the modern era have, have grown in our understanding of acting Shakespeare. There, mm. There's many after him who, who've done good things as well, but he, he was a, a visionary in some ways. But I mean, th this, this, this speech in particular, I mean, there, there is sort of that case to be made that this play is a pro-war play. It's a mm. glorifying war play in, in that sense. There's, there's that one side. There's text to back it up, which Olivier does. But what I think is interesting is that there are moments that are pro-war, but I think there are an equal amount of moments that are oh, anti-war. Yeah. But what's interesting in this version is that they cut a lot of those so mm. that it is, it, it textually it's more pro-war because of the cut. Um, because I think like, again, like with our victory, we've got dead children or like with, with this speech, even in Branagh's version, we've got the like literal like blasting fires and the, oh, the yeah. crawling in the trenches, crawling in the trenches. muddy trenches. Um, yeah, it's 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 awful stuff happening. Um, and that's and and you'll see how we set that up there. Uh, it could be pro war, but now we're getting into our. Our thesis, anti-war. Our oh. anti-war thesis, potentially. I think I think there's a case to be made for it being an anti-war play. This is 
I really do. Okay, here's my thing. I really do think it's meant to be ambiguous. Oh, I think yeah. it's meant to show both sides of war, and I think that it attempts not to take too strong of a stance either way. Yeah. To show you that war is complicated, which I think we know that, but thank you. I'm sure in Shakespeare's <laughs> time, we didn't know that necessarily. I mean, you've got to think of like coming off crusades, coming off of oh yeah, all of these battles were justified. I mean, even like coming off of the history of Henry V, like having, you know, our nation, uh, our nation, England, <laughs> having England, you the you know Shakespeare's nation go to war just because they wanted France ultimately. Oh yeah, I I mean, how do you how do you justify that? Like now, I don't think. It's, we could get away with it as easily. Oh no! Well, that's 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 the thing is I I agree with you. That I think it, it's ambiguous, and and Shakespeare scholar James Shapiro agrees. He says uh, this play is not an anti-war play. It's not a pro-war play. It's a going to war play, uh, which which I think he's right. Go to war. I would say though that um, when I bring myself to the play, for me it's anti-war. Mm. You know, like when when I. Imagine it in in the theater of my mind. Mm. <laughs> it's it's less ambiguous. Um, That's for a true. Reasons. Is that I mean how 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 is that for you? I mean, like when you imagine this, is it is it still ambiguous or do you do you bring that to it? I do think within like if I were to direct Henry V, which <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would or I will, but. I I do think ultimately anti-war. I mean, I think we open on them trying to justify a war that's not really justifiable. We come back to that later with the men saying like, "Look, if this is just a re- like if this wasn't just, we're all just going to die for no reason." Yeah. Like I think there's so many things that bring up how trivial war can be and how harmful cuz even even Henry's speech um when the French ambassador, you know, shows the tennis balls, he says like this mock, you know, mocks mocks um for mothers out of their sons oh and my God. Yeah. you know it's, wives it's, out of their husbands and mocks you know from the beginning we're seeing the loss it's awful it's awful i mean um it 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 it's sort of i mean to me the the biggest the biggest passage that that changes things is the the final epilogue mm. the um where I think it summarizes a lot of this, where it's it's like all of this seems to have been for nothing and unjustified. Do we want to um, go through the things that were cut in Olivier's first and end on the epilogue? Oh, we can we can end on the epilogue. Let's it's, let's, it's, let's build. I'm itching to to read that. We're epilogue. hopping around in the play a lot. Yeah, but remember we have that secret folio. <laughs> um, we have we have a different ordering. It it Woo. it's it's fascinating. So um. In our traditional ordering, just to keep up with the audiences at home, um, <laughs> uh, Olivier cut a lot. So the main points we're going to hit here with the things that he's cut, he cut um, Henry's advisors being traitors. He oh, cut Lord. Um, Bardolf being hung for stealing. He changed the sequence of the final battle. Um, in a way that I think is pro-war, and I will get into how that works. And he cut the part of the epilogue that... The secret part. <laughs> we'll get to it. We'll get to it. He he cut the part that makes it ambiguous. I mean, I mean, he made everything more pro-war. Oh, yeah. Well, So, starting with the traitors. We, so, we were sitting there watching this scene, and he was like... Uh, on a boat. He was on a boat, and he was like, so... Uh, this this guy over here, he did something bad. Should we should we treat him with mercy or should we not? And they were like, "Oh, do a do a big punishment." And usually, what happens next is he's like, "Okay, well, I found out you all were traitors, so I'm not going to use any mercy on you all because you think I shouldn't use mercy." But in this, mm-hmm. he just says, "Okay, we won't use mercy," and then it goes on to and the next. And then he thing. walks away. It's interesting because they keep in. So when Henry knows that they're traitors, he um in in the realm of playing tricks. Well, slash, like, asserting his power, asked them, you know, how they would treat a petty criminal who was maybe just drunkenly <laughs> rambunctious. Doing and, stuff, yeah. And, and, and they're harsh on him, um, and then he turns it around and is harsh back on his advisors, as Evan was describing. <laughs> but for some reason, they leave in the setup 
and then they they take away the punchline. It's it's no one no one's a traitor in this war. We were like, what what? Well, it was like saying, of course England could not have any government but a unified one. Well, that's, that's what <laughs> you said during the film because I was like, I think they cut the traitors, and you were like, national unity. <laughs> Yeah, it uh no Englishmen were on the other side in World War II, I'm sure. Well, that's yeah. that's the thing is, I mean, you'd think that they would want to show that traitors should be punished yeah, in but, a way. But it it was like it's a weird cut. It it was a weird cut. I I feel like I mean, this sort of has to do with all. And of they cut the, the chorus cuts. Well, they, saying that that would happen. That that would happen. I mean, it's 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 all these cuts that sort of when added up it makes this character that Shakespeare's written, Henry V, who is this full human being, Less into full. one who's not a real human. I mean, it it reads like... That was the thing with Olivier's performance, is I was like, it works, yeah. but you've taken away some of Henry's most human aspects. His personhood. It, and his personality, really. And it, and what makes him a great king. They took away some of the moments that make him great. Oh, yeah. Well, it, 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 it sort of reads almost... Like, when you watch the Olivier version, I almost see it as a play by one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, you know, mm. where it's it's the same kind of language, it's the same stuff, but it doesn't have that that life that Shakespeare has, mm. you know? That thing that makes Shakespeare's playwriting special. Yeah, so it, t- it took it all out, and it, it, it was like, it's like if you had Hamlet, but you, you took out every time that he, he, he was, sad. Like, was sad or questioning <laughs> if he should die. You know, <laughs> so coming to another moment that we're sad. It's really funny. Someone was playing hangman on that board. Oh my god! Oh, <laughs> we're Sorry, we're in the library currently. This is a podcast studio, and we've written notes on the board just just to just to make guidance. it so. That, yeah, guidance, a, a road, a path, and somebody played hangman. That I didn't notice it until right now. So um, another thing they cut. Um, was the hanging of Bardolph. So Bardolph, as we mentioned earlier, used to be pals back when Henry was Hal, young rogue, <laughs> devilish young ro- Okay, anyway. <laughs> a fun uh, guy who also guy. He robbed people, he drank smack, he drank, sherry. He slept with people, women of the night. Um, uh, and of the day, and of, uh, all sorts <laughs> of people. He just He just lived and lived and lived. <laughs> So, uh, this is one of his friends from then, um, and he is caught robbing a church, and he is brought before Henry, and he is told of his war crimes, and Henry goes through with executing him. Um, this is a pretty instrumental part, as, and we, we, we spoke about why this is important earlier, um, so now I think it's good if we mostly just talk about why cutting it is significant. Mm-hmm. Once again, we're taking out the English doing wrong. Yeah, which well, is interesting. It's like, of course, of course, England they wouldn't would never do something crimes. that is that is bad. I mean, on on both sides, because they're they're not there. There would never be soldiers who do this stuff. That's only the other side who does this stuff. But once again, it's interesting in the context of World War II that that they're avoiding showing what happens to someone who. Who commits war crimes? Yeah, I mean, it, it it really is. It's this it's this hollow version of this play. It it it, it really is. I mean, and and it's another instance of Henry not being a real person because he doesn't have mm. to struggle with that. Because mm-hmm. when he sees Bardolph, he remembers him. Yeah. I mean, he he remembers him, and he still decides he needs to to hang. And, and that's and that's especially it, it's in the text because um, Flewellen, right, is the one who comes yeah. up and he's kind of like it's Bardolph, you know, like. This, uh, yeah. And depending on how you play that, I think it's important that it's clear that you know Flewellen is like you know this guy, um, just because it kind of clues in the audience. And the cool thing about film is that we can have things like flashback and um, Henry, uh, Henry. Kenneth Branagh makes use of this in that we directly see that, like, when Bardolph is being hung, mm. he is remembering good times with him. And he actually gives some of Falstaff's original text um, in Henry IV to Bardolph. Um, and it really, it, 
He says, pulls on the heartstrings. He says, like, you wouldn't hang a thief or something like that. Yeah, when you're king, don't hang a thief. Yeah. Something. I'm misquoting Shakespeare. And, no, well, this is the, the folio version that we have. <laughs> um, I like this running <laughs> truth. Yeah. With, with, such a, with such a dark play in some ways, you have to have that fun folio. But, um, but, I mean, he says all that, and it just, I mean, in Kenneth Branagh's version, we haven't talked a lot about that because there, there almost isn't, a I'm ton just kind to of using about. it as a measuring stick. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's so makes, good. It's he, so good. Yeah, he makes a cut that makes more sense to the original purpose of the play. And he it, it, it comes alive. But but in Kenneth Branagh's version, it, it does have that that moment. And in in that play, Henry feels like a real person. Mm-hmm. And in in Olivier's, he just does not. He feels like mm-hmm. a just a oh look at honor, look at honor. Yeah. Um, what's next on our... Yeah, the next the next change that I found really interesting. So, originally, the battle ends when they, they come back, they find all of the boys have been killed, have been slaughtered back at the camp. It's very somber. A messenger comes over from France, and, you know, Henry's kind of like, okay, what now? You've killed all of these boys what do you have to say and they they ask if they can bury their dead and henry says in truth i know not if the day be mine or yours or something like that that? i think it's about that (laughs) i really like that line i hope i'm not terribly butchering it um and and the french ambassador says it's yours um and then we have kind of this moment of triumph on the back of a very somber occasion, yeah, which is war. War is not fun. Um, Olivier's, though, a little more fun. So first of all, we've got the carnival tents before we go off. Second of all, the battle is on a bright, sunny day. Uh, there's a bit of mud, but only the French fall in the mud. Well, it's not even really mud. It's like a puddle so you can see the reflection <laughs> of the horses and, and the colors of is, the horses. There's one moment where they push a group of French soldiers into mud, but then they cut away from the mud entirely. It's just funny because they fall in. Yeah. Also, they are in medieval like jousting armor. I don't. We could be wrong, but I, it it did not feel accurate to the period, and perhaps it was. But it was also there were so many so many people on horses. It was a very it was hundreds valiant of valiant battle because the horses looked cool. You know. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it was. It and was the a archers cool battle. were in shorts. They were in tiny little shorts, and they're, they're <laughs> and they didn't stay behind the barricade. They ran out into the battle with no armor on. There were there were there were. It was like, of course, we're going to win. Even though we say we're not going to win, we're mm-hmm. going to win this. It's it's inevitable. Mm-hmm. It's it's like, and they seem like yeah, they always seem like they were going to win. It's like it's like they're saying to British people at the time during World War II. I know we're all saying this is a this is a tough road ahead, mm. but really, I mean, it's inevitable. We we win these things. We're really cool. Um, so. so it's 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 that that's a big change. The and battle. You know sequence. what? I don't know much about war, but it felt a bit silly. I've never been to a war in this time period. Yeah, but it. I mean, this version of it, it really did. It it wasn't war. I mean, no. it, it really, it really was not. I mean, that, so that's... but the 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 biggest sequence change was actually at the end of the battle. So um, they come back, they find the boys slaughtered, which we kind of thought they'd cut that. We weren't sure, but they kept it in, I guess, to show how evil France is. And um, then Henry rides off angrily, meets the Dauphin on the battlefield, and defeats him ending the war yeah and then he rides back to the camp and when the french ambassador comes they already know they've won so we cut this moment of him being like in truth i know not if the day be mine or yours and instead the french ambassador comes up and he's like what what do you have to say and then the french ambassador is like i have this to say blah 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 blah. he's like also you won and like he completely cuts yeah any question of their victory because Rather than having something upsetting happening and then not even knowing if they won, he gets an immediate vengeance for what the French have done. He rides off and victoriously, you know, wins the day, yeah. which is uh, much more satisfying than Shakespeare's original um, way way of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, 
it's all it's all very I mean it, it watching this version makes me like Henry the Fifth as a play more because mm. by seeing the differences <laughs> in the cuts, I'm like, wait, no, no, the the play isn't about that. It's about mm-hmm. it's about how 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 hard this is and how how bad this is. And it made me realize what the play was about more because I was like, when you took those out, it just wasn't the same play. It wasn't the same play, and it wasn't it wasn't. I mean, there's characters in this who are strangely so relatable in in on a human level, not in a what they do level, but but they're on a human level, they really are. Mm. Um, but that that sort of brings us to the epilogue, the epilogue of the play, which is, I think, snaps. I think this is what brings everything together. And when it, when they didn't say it, I knew they weren't going to say it. I I was <laughs> sure they weren't because I was <laughs> like, this epilogue is so good, they can't say the whole thing. And so, if it's okay. I'm going to read the epilogue. Evan's going to read the epilogue. He's really excited. This is the chorus. It says, Thus far, with rough and all unable pen, our bending author hath pursued the story in little room confining mighty men, mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small, most greatly lived, this star of England, fortune made his sword by which... The world's best garden he he achieved, and of it left his son imperial lord, Henry the Sixth, in infant bands crowned king of France and England. Did this king succeed? Whose state so many had the managing that they lost France, and made his England bleed, which oft our stage hath shown, and for their sake in your fair minds. Let this acceptance take. So this, <laughs> this is interesting because he says, we, we, we put on the play, our author wrote this play, and it's not exactly what happened, and we could never do it exactly justice, mm-hmm. but it happened, the star of England, this, this celebrity, King Henry V, but his son, King Henry VI, lost, lost it all. Lost it all. It was all for nothing. They did all of this, and it ends... By saying they lost it back right away, essentially. Not right yeah. away, but they lost it back right away. And in the Olivier version, they don't say that they lost it. They never mm-hmm. say that... Uh, that Henry is a, Henry VI is a wee babe. Yeah, they, they just say like... And he loses it all. They say this most greatly lived star of England. Fortune made his sword by which the world's best garden he achieved. And of it left his son, Imperial Lord. I think that's what they end on. And that's it. And then and then everyone goes, Woo! Well, because even in the beginning, when Henry gives his speech um, after to de- basically declare war, when he declares war, um, right after the entire court is like, very nice speech. Yeah. Lovely. It's, it's, um, it's like crazy. Like it was a performance. Like it wasn't. It wasn't nearly as moving as when it was. It happened in the Branagh version, and everyone was at apt attention. There's a moment where, like, the entire room stands in support of their king, seeing that he is great. And in this one, he did feel a little more like a little boy. Yeah. Well, it. I mean, I don't know, but that. I feel like that epilogue just sums it all up because mm. we skip through. We see all these moments in the play. We've got the narrator saying all this stuff. He says, "Look here. There's this." Great battle. Look here, there's this battle. Look here, there's this. And then at the end, it's... Don't forget what comes next. It all didn't matter. It all didn't matter. So, yeah. Yeah. Anti-war, pro-war. Maybe both. For me, it's anti-war. But it's also... I mean, it's it's full of life. It's ambiguous. Mm. Which maybe... And you know what? I, I really hate war, but it... I, the play. You know? Yeah. Well, I think I think saying that we hate war is a good transition into the the, the sort of our epilogue of this because this is all stuff that we 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 are we have a, an opinion on a, a grasp, grasp on. of. But there's there's this strange part of the play mm-hmm. to me that is Kate. It's a woman. The the basically the the only um, female role uh, uh, the, of royalty the nanny of royalty. And her. There's. Well, well, I mean, there's also Mistress Quickly, who's 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 got That's true. some incredible parts. But this is the only, but brief, brief. But yeah, she's the one who, who delivers the the 
false staff news and all that. And but but she's not. She's only she's in the not beginning royal. of the play. She she doesn't come in later. But this this role is is the woman who is in it at the end. And it's strange. And it's kind of out of place. Th- there's one scene where we see her attempting to learn English, and it's very much comedic relief. There's some wordplay in there that's quite dirty. We won't yeah. get into it, but, but you she, know. She's, she's learning English. It's mostly French. But then after the war, after all of this happens, there's sort of a break. And then Henry comes, and he's... There's a wooing scene. He woos her. And it's it's very fast, but they end up getting married. Mm-hmm. Or, or to be married, at least. And it's interesting to me because ultimately, you know, the king the king of France chooses to leave them alone together. And I just get the sense that, like, she doesn't really have a choice in this. So I guess it's a little confusing to me that they go through this entire scene. And also, there's no way that he loves her. No. So why is he even... Sa- like, and he doesn't have to, yeah. quite frankly. So I've been I've been wrestling with this. It confuses me. Let me share my theory. Okay, I'd love to hear. We'll we'll see if it's if it holds ground, if it maybe maybe does anything. Because I was thinking, I was like, so all this other stuff in the play, I mean the epilogue is so fantastic in the way it I kinda it, it like shows this that. scene though. Well that's the thing, is I was like, but why why would this happen if it didn't matter? Then I was like, what if it does matter? What if this happens after the war? Because it's showing what could have been done instead of the war. It's showing that mm-hmm. if he had wooed her, if he had tried to have love be the thing that brought the two countries together, it would have worked. Because he still has to do it at the end. Mm. He still does it at the end, despite having just fought in this war. He still has to woo her. Mm. But at the beginning, he says, they offer her hand in marriage, and he says, no, no. Yeah. I won't take that. But at the end, he does that. And so I was like, maybe this is showing... If he'd only just done this, he could have skipped all the other stuff. Because it's so out of place. It, it feels so strange that this is what we end on. And I was like, maybe. D- does that hold any merit? Does that? Does I think that- that's interesting. I I think it does. I think that's definitely a way to view it. I, I mean, I don't really have a way to view it. I do have opinions on the scene itself, though, which is what I can share. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the issue of consent here. Because um, that's what I've seen people discussing is... She's somewhat coerced into it, but then yeah. it can be played like she's enjoying this. But then he is kind of like, no. And she's all like, no, we don't kiss here. And he's like, oh, but we can. I'm the king. Yes. And and in both the film versions we've seen, it's ended up being sweet. But textually, there's nothing she really says that directly in, uh, implies that. Um like, I think it can be read no. into, oh, yeah. certainly. Like, I think a lot of her lines being like, oh, like, I don't know what you mean by like, like saying you like me. I don't, I don't know what that means. That can be played that way. But, but it, then I'm wondering why she holds out so long. Um, and I think it's just that her name is Kate. But for me, for some reason, <laughs> it's somewhat reminiscent of the beating of Petruchio and Katarina yeah. and Taming of the Shrew. Um I mean, it's a very different scene. There's not a matching of wits or any of those things, <laughs> really. But I think in the in the chase and the like certainty that like she will want him, Henry is certainly more humble, and he says like, "I have no other way to woo you," and all of these things. But he's still giving these long speeches to win her hand. Yeah. Um, when it seems like it's already kind of predetermined by the father. Well, that's that's the thing. Is he also he also? I mean, he just completely destroyed her people in, in this awful battle. And she asks him, why would I why would I love you who's the enemy of France? And he says, I'm not, I'm not the, the enemy. enemy of France. I love France so much, I want all of France. I mean, that's why I feel like this is this is almost shown as as like a a a like a strange little like you see how love can't happen now? You know? Mm. Like it, if if they had started Without war, they maybe could have fallen in love, but but now it's just this the weird language barrier. Because it's it's so it's so there. I mean, there's a barrier. Yeah, the language barrier. Maybe that represents they've been at war. Now it's this, and out of out of this this marriage comes their son Henry the Sixth, who mm. is a, a failure Flops. of a king. Yeah, flop era. I don't know. Yeah, I do think it's interesting too because I found the nurse being there as a translator very reminiscent 
of um, the relationship we see in Henry the Four Part One between that one guy and his wife, who's Welsh and doesn't speak yes, any yes, English. Yes, yes, yes. And it, they it, have love. They, they have a trans, and they're in love. Oh my, yeah. And their translator is the father, and I think Olivier plays with this. I don't know if intentionally or no. Um, in that, the, I remember pretty distinctly. There's a shot where they zoom into the couple of Henry and Kate, and then they pan over to Henry and and the nanny, who he then turns to and is like, "Wait, can you translate this?" Yeah, and then she's like inserted, and then she's kind of between them. Well, that's that's such a great comparison because I I hadn't connected those things, but earlier in this series of of the Henry ad, <laughs> there's there's there is presented a similar pairing of, of two people who don't well, speak the same don't language. Understand why they two love people each other. from, but those two love each other for real. Yeah, in, they in do. that in the Henry the the fourth. They do. But I don't in know. This, I still don't know why. But, but they, they do. It's it's. I mean, it's just They're side characters. It's clear they're side characters who who actually do love each other. But this this is like and it's in juxtaposition, I think, to Percy and oh yeah, Percy and them. But now it Percy. now it sort of seems like it's in juxtaposition a little bit to the king and. And her because because there there's this, I mean he's he's not he's not asking for translation because he wants to be in love. It seems like it's mm. still political in some ways. Yeah, like he just needs to speed it up. They, that's why the scene is sh- so short in some ways, is because it's not about them falling in love. It it's about them marrying. Long at that point. Well, it, in it the feels play. it's long, but it's it's not like she holds out quite a bit. She well she holds out, but like look at look at Benedict. Okay, and and not and much then. as far as like I don't know the enemies to lovers type trope goes, but yeah. she's introduced to him in the last scene, so like yeah. we, it, it's not like that can happen. Well, but but also I mean, who's imagine to say if that, she was like, no. <laughs> well, she could. I mean, who's to say that she's not thinking that? I mean, mm-hmm. who's to say that it's it's her kingdom is destroyed. He is the king now. Yeah. He's saying, "Love me." He's not being incredibly pushy but when he pushes Seems he nice. gets what he wants yeah so it's when he asks for when he well not asks when he says you're gonna kiss me she she does and and mm-hmm. there's not it seems it seems seems like it's not true love there i mean they talk about love but it's like there's no way well how's Call never me been a in skeptic love? <laughs> how how's never been in love before and so he's he, and now he's king and and now he, I how, mean, how I, it feels love? like another thing that he's given up. I mean, in yeah. in becoming king, he's given up every other truthful relationship. So why not a marriage? And at this point, I think that royalty, I think, like I, I know so much about how royals were. <laughs> I've watched a lot of TV. I've, I've watched <laughs> period dramas. Um, <laughs> it seems, though, that culturally at the time, you know, marriage is not necessarily for love, even even with people who aren't nobility, you know, marriage isn't always necessarily for love. It's for social status. It's for resources. It's for uniting nations. And, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. for power. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't get that opportunity. And, and that's one of the things that war and, and being king has taken away from him. Yeah. Yeah. So, ultimately... Something's the deal with Kate. Something's the deal. I think so. I, I think I can't there's a reason there's why she's there. I think I, I think it's got to do with the rest of the show. If the rest of the show is about war and and, and this, Henry, I and think Henry. the show's very much about and Henry him and, being and a, a king. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I think there's something to it. And but, there's um, loneliness there. And now he's entering into a marriage where he's going to be lonely. Yeah. Well, I think. I think for There's us a language to language barrier. I think for us to fully understand, for us to fully understand this, we'd probably have to read this another hundred times. <laughs> I also think it's interesting, though, that we see a very humble Henry before Kate, of him mm-hmm. being like, "Look, I can't <laughs> with words. I'm not. I'm not great." That's also interesting in the context of like Henry the Fourth, or like you, you know, Bolingbroke. Or in the yeah. context of Richard the Second, and like what each person is good at—is it action? Is it words? And it seems that yeah. Henry, in this moment, is at least claim. Which Henry gives some insane, insanely great speeches. <laughs> I mean, he's brilliant for he's him brilliant. to say that he's not very good with language. 
Um, but in this moment, I mean, it's a bit reminiscent of his father being action driven in that he's like, I can't woo you with words. Ask me to jump on a horse. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a lot in this play. It's a lot in this play, which, which I think my first reading of didn't bring it all out, but, but in, in thinking about it and, and watching versions of it, it's sort of come to life in my in my head, and it's sort a of a lot more. <laughs> it's sort of lived with me for the past week weeks or so, um, yeah. in in some unexpected ways that only Shakespeare can do. It's a pretty good play. I always <laughs> thought I would really hate the the history, so I'm very grateful to this class <laughs> for making me read them because I feel like it just with the Henry ad, even I mean without you know Henry the Fourth Part Two. Um, I just still feel like I le- I know a lot more of even just like what Shakespeare was considering at the time. Oh yeah, yeah. I I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. Well, okay. I think we can we can wrap this up and and say a couple thank yous. Thank you to uh, Professor Ames Library. <laughs> oh well, Ames Library Pro- for their podcast system. For their podcast system, Professor Joanne Diaz. For your wonderful class. And guidance. And guidance and humor. Yes, I appreciate that in the mornings. And fun and 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 for letting us always walk in just two minutes late. <laughs> um, every single class. Uh, I come and prepared. And for letting me into this class. I really needed it, so I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, and check out her podcast, which... Um, I believe it's called Poetry for All. Yeah, if you're listening and, and don't already know of it. Professor Joanne Diaz. At Illinois Wesleyan University. <laughs> we are... She's like your dog singer. <laughs> 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 yeah, 4444 <laughs> Illinois Wesleyan Road. Um, yeah. That's a fake address. Yes. Well... I'm Evan Carlson. I'm Grace Lumpkin. And we made a thank podcast. You. We made a podcast and we thank you for for listening on this day. Yeah, just the two of us. We few. <laughs> we happy few. We band of brothers, siblings. We band of siblings. We're from North Carolina. We we both knew each other from then. And we're in here now. And now we're rambling. So please have a good day, night, evening, etc. Finish washing your dishes. If you were listening to this, washing your dishes and got floored by our conversation. <laughs> um, oh, it didn't record anything. I'm going to kill you. Just kidding. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>